Bless you for being 
who you are. Just for being God. Thank you, God. God, you're holy. My God. Well, can we just lift our hands all over the room as a sign of worship? Yes, God. Our Father. God, oh, bless your name. Oh, you're awesome. You're mighty in this place. Oh, mm -hmm. 
I've got something in my spirit that I want to I want to do today. Um, we've been talking about no excuses, and today we're going to talk about becoming another man. And uh, and I want to encourage you today that that no matter where you are, there's another opportunity for you to do greater. And so I've asked Keisha to come. Keisha's going to come share with us for about ten minutes, ten to twelve minutes. Thank you. Keisha's going to come share with us. Keisha, she's going to bless us this morning. You can do better than that. Come on. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Good morning. Good morning. I want to talk about how God orchestrated my life when I didn't even have a vision or a plan for my life. Um, started at age 16, we had a child. At age 19, we had another child. I can never forget um, Rico and I, you know, we moved in together, didn't have a plan, didn't have no type of future plan for our kids. And where I was from, it was okay not to graduate from high school. As long as you get your job, if you graduate, you don't. It was a group of us that had a children in high school. Some of us went off to college, some of us didn't. So at 19, I ended up being at Trina by default. I was receiving Social Security from my dad, and it was about to get cut off. So they said, if you go to college, they'll continue your check. So I was like, okay, let me go to Trenum. <laughs> so <laughs> I, en I enrolled at Trenum, and a month later, they said, we still going to cut your check off. Wow. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to stay. And I ended up becoming a school patrol lady at age 20. You know, the lady, the cute lady being the robber. So it's you know you work only morning and you work evening after school. So I need a part time job, and I saw a listing for a lunchroom cashier, three hour job. And I called MPS Central Office, and the lady said, "Well, come on down. We have an open. Come down." And she said, "Well, we have an office aid position open at South Lunch." And I was like, no, that's not me. She said, yeah, let me call the principal, which was Kina Manai. And she called her and she said, well, tell her to come on in for an interview. And I was like, well, I'm not interviewing great. I have on jeans and sandals. She said, come on. So I ended up at South Club Middle School that day. And Tina Manai, and she asked me a couple of questions. That was my first real interview. And she asked me a couple of questions. She said, mm, there's something about you. So I'm going to give you a chance. She said, can you start tomorrow? Yes, ma'am. So when I got there the, um, the next day, of course I was nervous because I never did no type of office aid or secretary work. And she introduced me to Delita. And so I was her little protege for a couple of years. She uh, she was so nice. And I was like, this is too nice. Something ain't right. Yeah, Delita. The real Delita. She was so nice. <laughs> she took me under her wing. Every day she would teach me this and teach me that. And by then, a couple years that went by, 2002, I graduated from Trenum that December, and I was enrolled at ASU that January 2003. So, but Delisa, you going to do something there? Why don't you have plans? I said, I'm going to enroll at ASU, and I think I'm going to teach. So, of course, I was around a lot of educators, and they would encourage me at work. So, I started that in 2003. I then the leader decided, oh, you want to go to church? Did you go to church? I said, yeah, I go to the South Club Church sometime. She said, okay, well, I'm going to invite you to church. And I ended up at First Baptist. And I didn't take my kids with me that Sunday. So that next week she said, well, I'll pick the kids up for you. And I was like, I didn't take mom. I don't know how to pick the kids up. <laughs> so from then I started bringing my kids to church. And then, you know, we ended up joining the church. We was there a couple. In 2005, I began teaching at South Lawn Middle School. That's my first year teaching. Again, no goal, no plan, no vision. I never had a guidance counselor to call me down and say, hey, because I had a baby, so you know, who was the at-risk student? So no one noticed us. Wow, wow. So wow. again, no one ever wow. said, hey, you got plans for college? Hey, did you take the ACT? Back then, we was taking at school. No one never went over. Um, we had exit exams. I had passed all the exit exams. So 
we was like, oh, okay, you pass all the exits and you want to graduate. But again, no one ever got me or asked me. They say, hey, you ever thought about college? What you want to do in life? So it's just amazing how God would put you in a place where you can help others and others can help you. Again, in my circle, no one was in college at that time. I had dreams and goals to go to college. Um, I was number six out of seven kids. I was the first to go to college. So when I became an educator, when I graduated from ASU, it was like a big, big, big deal. My family was a big deal for me. So, you know, and people always tell me, I know Bishop told me, he may not remember a long time ago before I graduated, you know, you have to break generational curses. And I was like, wow, I never thought about breaking them. Never thought, you know, there's different stepping stones in life we have to go through. But I always remained positive because I always had people around me. The leader will always encourage me. And when I finished ASU, you know, he said, you need to go get your master's. And this is a person that don't have a master's degree. I'm like, I'm going to do that. Because I got Rico did do this. She said, girl, we got it. And she would do things. Um, Rico would do things. So I had a whole support team. Again, never imagined having a master's degree. So when I went on to become a teacher, I taught for six years. Then she was a, one of my principals. She told me one time, she said, well, I need you to do this, go out to teach and do this and do that. And I was like, I'm not her grandma. She said, this is going to prepare you. And she said, and she gave me a hard talk one day. And it hurt my feelings. She called me, now you don't even know me. She said, you know, let me tell you something. It's not always about being cute. Learn some things. Step your game up. So from then, I was like, okay. So she had me doing the work of a guidance counselor before I came to counselor. And it was hard to try to get that job because, you know, everybody in the system, 90% of people has a counseling degree. So I met some other women. They would mentor me. And then when I became a graduation coach slash counselor at JD, I noticed that no one wanted to deal with the at-risk kids. No one. If you was pregnant, if you was from the project, if you looked like you, I mean, perception, you didn't look like nobody, no one wanted to deal with those kids. So I knew that was my purpose. So anytime a kid got in trouble, got afraid, anything went on, they would send them to me. And I would encourage those kids. They never had a desire to graduate high school. And I was like, you know, this used to be me. And I would get those kids. We would work with them. Night school. It was time I had to go to night school a whole year because I was out due to my pregnancy. And didn't have transportation. It was a day-to-day -day that I had to catch a ride to go to meet. And remember, I was in Carver Zone. So just to make it. I had to pay my own night school. So when kids at JD wanted to go to night school, they would come to me because I let them get free. I was like, they're going to pay later. <laughs> By then, they've been receiving the credit. But it was just amazing how all the kids I would get, I was visiting with some um, parents who, again, never thought about graduating high school. Sent a lot of kids to the military. And they was always like, oh, I'm going to get killed. I can't go to the military. So I was on the ASVAB test, and I would sign them up, and I would do some stuff. You sit right here. You sit right there. I would sit them accordingly to people that I know. And they was like, I passed the test. I know. <laughs> you passed the test. Great job. And they would go on to the military. But they, they were so scared to dream. Because the myth of our parents and grandparents would tell us, no, you can't do it. You're going to get killed. And I used to explain to them, you know, you ever been around when they had a shootout or you been in a place that didn't shoot? Yeah, did you die? No. Okay. Tell the same situation. You can bypass things. Just speak God first. And now, a couple years ago, or two years ago, I got a head counseling job, and the job was posted. And I was like, I'm not going to apply for that. I ain't ready for that. They're not going to hire me. So one of my old assistants, he kept calling me. He said, you should apply for the job. And then my friend Sean called me. She said, apply for the job. And I did. But when I applied, people would call me and say, hey, I know the counselor. I know the counselor. And I said, no, I don't want nobody to call me. I said, I just want God to get all the glory if I get this job. I don't want nobody. And then one of my mentors downtown kept calling me. She said, I'm going to call him. I said, no, ma'am, please don't call. I don't want nobody to call. So I went on an interview. And a week later, didn't hear anything back. School was about to begin. The teacher said, 
to go back and she called Mickey and she was saying, and she was like, well, he called somebody else. I was like, well, I said, that's strange because I said that's my job. Mm. She said, please stop being like the preacher. She said, I don't know what to tell you about it, but it says, God says my job. Mm. So when I got back to work the first day, um, started cleaning my office. I said, let me get away from this paper. I started cleaning my office and going through stuff because it was small. That's on the Thursday. Friday, I get a call from the clerk. She said, can you come back for the interview? I did two interviews in one day. About three o'clock that day, he called me. He said, you got the job. I saw your paperwork. I promise you, I cleaned my office in 30 minutes. I know I did 15. Because <laughs> I had to get work that Monday. <laughs> and this was on the show. I didn't want nobody calling. He told me after I started. He said, you know what? I don't like when people call me my job. Or they have people they think in power can get them a job. And just to say, what God has for you is for you, no matter where you're from, what you've been through, he will still. I mean, I go through things on my job all the time, and I remain firm, because I know God. When they say budget change, or they're going to cut, I don't entertain that, because I know God placed me there, I know he can keep me, and if he moved me, he has something better. And I'm so glad I have, even with my niece and nephew, I encourage them to stay in school, you know, finish high school. Then they didn't think it was important. But when you stay on them and encourage them, it makes a difference. And to go on, you know, people look at Rico and I, you know, sometimes people think you always had. You know, it always is. We have seasons. But God always provides. Yeah. And I'm not trying to tell Rico's story. Yeah. <laughs> them tell his own. But God has been really, really good to us. In yeah. spite of, you know, to have a child at 16. We have children at 16 and 19. It's just amazing what God has done with our life. And I just want to share, and I'm so grateful. Yes, God. I may not look like it sometimes or act like it or my nose, it, but I'm so grateful. <laughs> <laughs> say much. Don't really need to say much because all of us have a story. And what God told me to do is to start celebrating our stories. So one day you may get that call and say, hey, can we talk about you? So all you do is talk about you. Because your story should be his story. Yes. You feel what I'm saying? And if I can say this just as a secondary thing, can I piggyback your story for a minute? I'm a proud of her. So proud of her, so proud of Rico. Rico will tell his part one day, and you and I go fill in that part. But what God has done in their lives. But, but let me, can I, can I just be greedy for a second and steal a moment? Sometimes you don't value what you have right beside you because you don't always see it working. I didn't know how much she played in her life and other lives, just being where she is, you know. And we made a decision early in life when, we, when, when I came to ministry that she would be the one that would keep the job in the school system and we would get our girls up and our girls grew up together and she would keep us insurance and she would do all those things that, that ministry has not afforded me yet. That, that, that ministry has not afforded me yet. Life insurance. Medical insurance. Yeah. Yeah. We ain't no mega church. We ain't got all that in place yet. You see what I'm saying? But she made the sacrifice to stay on the clock. So I try to keep the house clean. <laughs> try to cook for you at night. Try to make sure something. I, I do the laundry. Yeah. I don't, don't 
pull up on me because I know how to swing too. I do know. <laughs> don't play for it. Don't play for it. Don't play for it. Uh, but, I, but I know what it is. And, and I want to say to her, you know, um, in the midst of all of this, thank you. Because yes. sometimes you don't know. You just don't know what you do. And I remember when we first came to ministry, we were laughing. And I passed at the time. And when, when we first connected at First Baptist, I passed at the time. We used to laugh. Um, and, and when we got installed in Clinton, we met Mother Maud and McGora and, and that core group who, who still supports us from Clinton. I remember Pastor Welch said to us on the installation, um, you're going to wear a hat for me. I'm going to get you one of them big hats. I'm going to buy you a hat for you, but you're going to wear a hat. She said this. She said, no, I ain't no hat wearing first lady. I'm just the leader. Amen. But now I take the money. <laughs> she ain't crazy. <laughs> but, but sometimes, watch this, we set our picture of what a first lady should be or what a person should be and how they have to interact because we're looking from where we've been and we miss where we're going. Yeah. We miss where we're going. So I got to publicly say, after her, after Keisha sharing as she has, thank you, Benita. I gotta say thank you. <laughs> gotta say thank you. Uh, Keisha, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, they've been friends to our family. We've been friends for many years now. And it's, it's funny because she used to come home and talk about that little girl in the office. <laughs> she said, but she's so sweet. I said, she don't look sweet. I came the first time. I said, she don't look sweet. She's so sweet. <laughs> first seven and ten chapter. I'm going to be real brief because my sermon has already been preached. Amen? Amen? The sermon has already been preached. The words have already been released. I want to talk today about no excuses. Becoming another man. Becoming another man. You don't have to stay where you are. You don't have to be what you think or what they told you. You can be something greater. And I was, I was kept hitting Apostle, Apostle Herb, thank God for him. I kept hitting Apostle Herb saying, man, she's preaching my sermon. She's preaching my sermon. She's preaching my sermon. So I thank God for lining things up the way he does. I try to be led of him, and sometimes I miss him. Sometimes I miss him. Okay, sometimes you miss him too. Hallelujah. Ain't nobody been a thousand of him. All right, first chapter, first chapter of the 10th chapter. I want to look down at verse, um, at verse, um, well, uh, let's go to straight to verse six. That's that's where I wanna, I wanna, I wanna go. Uh, but yet, yeah, let's go to five. Verse first seven, ten chapter verses five and six. Hey mother, how you doing, mother Ma? Good to see you, mama. Hallelujah. Uh, I honor all the leaders and all the all the servants of the house. Praise God. Uh, uh, the kids are doing children's church today. Amen. 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 Praise God. We've got first Sunday children's church. So I'm praying that our mommies who don't have babies can focus and get some good word in the day. Amen. Amen. We want to continue to serve the body and make ways for us. And, and I thank you know I thank God for people being around you that will challenge you because I'm thinking about future plans and what we need you and they're like, nah, we can do something now. You gotta do now. You can't wait until you get to where you're going to do it. You gotta start doing stuff now. And so let's do some stuff now. Amen. 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 First seven to ten chapter, verse five. Here we go. Hallelujah. After thou shalt come to the hill of God. If I said the hill of God. Hill of God. Where is the garrison of the Philistines? It shall come to pass that when thou art come thither to the city, thou shalt meet a What's this? Watch this now. A company of prophets coming down from the come on, talk to me. High place with a psaltery and a tablet and a pipe and a harp before them. And they shall do what? Prophesy. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee and thou shalt do what? Prophesy with them. They're going to prophesy, and the Spirit's going to fall on you, and you're going to prophesy along with the prophets. Now, he ain't no prophet yet. He just got oil. Talk about this in a minute. Because watch this. You can have oil and not have identity. You can be anointed to do a thing and not know who you are 
and you still won't get to where you got to be. Yeah. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them. Watch this. And shall be turned into another man. Let it be when these signs are come unto thee, that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. Father, I praise you now and bless you now for this time in your word. We be magnify your name. We give you honor. We give you glory in Jesus' name. You know, God, that you and I have a covenant that if I open my mouth, you're going to speak. So we ask you to speak now to your hearts, minds, and souls, and spirits of your people, that we may thereby be changed. We may not ever, ever, ever be the same in Jesus' name. Amen. Ah, Jesus. Come on, do me a favor. Give God one big, quick, quick hand of praise. Listen, pray for me today. Hallelujah. Pray for me today. I'm going to be heading down to Mobile for the Gulf Coast experience. Um, down in Mobile, Alabama. Mobile, Alabama, Eastgate Bible. We're going to be down there and, and host a worship service on that end. So I'm glad to be here, and we're going to, we're going to share this word and get moving. 8.39 will be through by 9 o'clock. Hallelujah. No excuses. Becoming another man. Let me give you a situation that you're living in right now. <clears throat> from the beginning of time, God had a divine design for his creation. He said, from the beginning, let us make man in our own image and in our own likeness. Okay? And he created man as a mirror and an image of God. That means a replication or a duplication of that which is divine. So we were already created as, as his creation in a divine state of unending communion with God and undying success because there was no flaw in us. We were perfect from square one. But then there came square two. Part of his creation rebelled against him in the form of Michael the archangel. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Lucifer the archangel. He took one third of the heavenly host and therein entered um, the demonic warfare in the heavenlies, which eventually became man's rebellion in the earth. Because he, as the serpent of the garden, tempted Eve, tempted Adam, they followed the sin, and they lose their original status. They're no longer what God designed us to be, so everything we're doing now is a do-over. We're all becoming. Look at your neighbor tell them you're becoming. You ain't there yet. We're all becoming. We're all in a process. I love how teacher told the story. She showed progress in a process. And each of us are becoming according to what God had, has designed for us to do. But we're not what we were originally intended to be. You do know he's making up some stuff. He's redoing some stuff. He's fixing some things. Because we're not the perfect beings, though some of us may think we are. We're not the perfect beings that we were supposed to be. And so watch this. All of what God has been doing since Genesis 3 has been acts of restoration and restitution to bring us back to his original design. So the man that you are now is not the man you're fully supposed to be. That's your dilemma. Where there's defeat, he originally placed victory. Where there's doubt, he originally placed an undying confidence. When there's broken communication, he originally placed a communion that was unbroken until sin entered in. We are all in a place where God's trying to fix some stuff. Now here's the beauty of it. He's already fixed it because he fixed it before it was ever broken. He gave us a lamb and revelations call him the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Now watch this. It doesn't mean that he died in heaven. That means that he was purposed to die in heaven and he died in earth to fix everything that was messed up. So everything that's good about you is because of the blood now. So watch this. Just like Christ was purposed in heaven to come, live, die, undo the works of the enemy, so were you purposed in heaven. There's a purpose and a plan over your life according to Ephesians 2 and 10 that was there before the foundation of the world that God says this is who you are and you're on a journey to discover. My God. Ain't none of us got it all yet. My God. My God. Talk to me somebody. Yes. So, so as we've been challenging you this, this, these past few weeks, we've been talking about what's in your hand, what's God's purpose for, what are you going to do with it, and what's going to be the manifestation. Can I tell you the simple manifestation?
manifestation of all that is to be is to be what Christ calls you to be. Ah. Everything else is working toward that. Oh Even your failures are working for your good. What did you say? Hmm. We're all in the process. So, so, so why am I telling you you've got to become another man? It's because the man that you are in the flesh is not the man you're supposed to be in the spirit. And so watch this. If you don't have, if you don't learn, as Jesus said, to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow him, then you won't truly move into what we call discipleship. Now, let me say this to you in denying yourself. See, most of us think that denying ourselves means staying away from what's bad. Come on now. But some of your denying yourself means to quit telling yourself no and do that, which is good. Because some of us ain't doing nothing too bad. But we're just sitting in a place and we ain't doing nothing and we ain't doing nothing worth talking about. We're just existing instead of living. Yeah. We got the power of God inside of us and we won't activate it to become another man. See, what they know you as and who they know you as is not who God said you are. When you can get to the point to where you can manifest who God said you are, then the world will truly be ready to celebrate you. Oh, Jesus. Now watch this. In, in the life of Samuel, I'm using, I'm using, using, um, <coughs> I'm sorry, not Samuel. I'm using Saul. I'm using Saul today to show you the change in how you become another man. Now watch this. Notice here, when you begin the beginning of this chapter, if I said no excuses, no excuses. When you begin to begin this chapter, Samuel actually takes a vial of oil and anoints Saul with oil. He does not totally clarify everything, but he pours the oil over him and anoints him. Now, this is an Old Testament picture of a New Testament revelation that we're walking in now. See, your old man, once you come into salvation, you have an oil on your life now called the Holy Ghost. All right? Now, there's a difference between indwelling and anointing. Okay? He's in you but watch this, he still has to anoint you to do a thing, and you do a thing out of season, and you're going to stay frustrated. If you just do what mama done told you, you're going to stay frustrated. But I'm going to show you in a minute that God has put voices in the earth, people around you, to help you get to where you're supposed to be. But you got to have a level of discernment to know who's talking God and who's talking self. It's some folk around you don't want you to be successful because it makes them more comfortable in their un being unsuccessful. You, you ever had that friend y'all talked a whole lot when you was in trouble, but once you start getting better, they stop calling? Come on, somebody. Uh -huh. you, I mean, they, they, they love you when you're down, you broke, busted, disgusted, and gloomed, despair, and all that. They are good friends to you in your, in your, in your, your trouble time, but they can't handle you in your triumphant time. It's because you became something that they couldn't handle. And, and watch this. When you were in your misery, they could be good company to you and it helped them fulfill their purpose in life. But then when you began to grow and see the triumph of the Lord, then all of a sudden their misery didn't match, didn't, didn't, didn't match your victory. There's some people around you. Now watch this. Samuel and Lord Saul with the oil. He pours it over his head. And he says, watch this, watch, he says, because the Lord has anointed you to be captain over his inheritance. Now, he says, he, he's going to give you leadership, he's going to give you a leadership role, watch this, and he's going to put him in the place of a steward. To be captain over the inheritance means that God's got some resources that he wants to put you in charge of. But he's not going to put you in charge of it until you got his oil. Because watch this, if he gave you everything he wants to give you in yourself, you're going to have to fool with it. My God, my God. Be for real now. When you was in the world, if you had more money, it'd be more wine, women, and songs. <laughs> it'd be more clothes, more stuff. It'd be more stuff if you had it in your immaturity. But now that the Holy Spirit has come upon you and he's growing you, he's maturing you, he's building your character, you're a little bit more frugal and more wise and more, more discerning about what you do and what you have. It ain't just about a good time no more. It's about kingdom purpose. So he says he's, he's anointing you to be Lord over his inheritance. And he's going to give you this power. Watch this. It's going to begin to flow out of you, but he's got to put you in the right place. Everybody's in the right place. Right place. Notice here that, that, that Saul has to move 
into a different place than he was standing. He had to go to the mount of the Lord, a designated place where things had to happen for him. And not just happen for him, but happen to him. Now watch this. Here's the first thing I want you to understand. That God has set some people ahead of you to help develop you. If you're going to be changed into another man, you need somebody to stand in where you want to go. See, some of us, some of, some of us, some of us are so independent and so selfish until we think nobody can tell us nothing. God has already set some people, and what has happened is we don't know how to honor the resources in our life, and we end up lacking and taking a lot longer to get to where God wants us to be. Because He says, I keep sending you wisdom, but you won't listen to Him. You're so busy feeling bad for yourself till you won't even stop and just listen to what's around you. You got all this wisdom around you, but you're too busy crying. You're too busy being mad. You're too busy being in your emotions. God has already placed people in a place to get you to a place. Notice what the scripture says. Now the scripture says, watch this, that when you go to this mount of the Lord, there's going to be, watch this, a company of prophets. First of all, he says, you're going to go to the hill of the Lord. And there's going to be a company of prophets coming down from the high place. Listen, there is someone who's already ascended to where you're climbing to. And you got to see them as a resource. They're only an open door to your next. Have you ever seen people as doors? Now, I'm not saying be, be, be foolish and just not respect people. But people have things on their lives that you need. They've got oil and an anointing, a knowledge and instruction that you need to hear in order to ascend. They're already in that place. The prophets came down from the hill of the Lord. In other words, they had already been with God and been in his presence. And now he says that they're going to come down the hill and as they're descending, you go ascend. Can I, can I say this to you too? Can I put you in the place of the prophets, the school of the prophets, the company of prophets? Let me put you in that place for a minute. If you're not willing to share the knowledge you gain, you're selfish. You've learned enough to bless somebody who is ascending as you're descending. And I'm not talking about coming low, I'm talking about humbling yourself to help somebody. Somebody can use your knowledge. You, you don't get to your story without somebody saying, come on, you can do this. You heard the word of testimony. You don't get to your story without somebody saying, listen, go do this, try this. Let me share this little bit of knowledge with you. It ain't just about being cute. I never heard that part before. But it ain't just about being <laughs> that, that, Listen, there's somebody in your circle that has what you need. That was the company Don't allow familiarity to cut you off from your increase. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something about folk who know. Okay, I'm going to mess with some of y'all for a minute. Folk who know ain't always telling you they know. It's folk who don't know and trying to know who always got to tell you who they are. Folk who know will sit back and just relax. Okay, when they, when they finally see the oil, then I'll pour everything I got into him. You, you ain't always got to tell him. So he says, the company of prosperity, so he's got people ahead of you. He's already placed people in the right place so that when you get there, you've got the resources that you need. Watch this. Not only has he already placed people, but he's already set that place. Remember the hill of the Lord, watch this. And, and what you got to understand is placement here, watch this, is not a destination, but it's a process. They were coming down from the hill of the Lord. He was moving. And let me say this to you. Lord, shit, show God me with this this morning. You know God never called folk who ain't doing nothing. But everybody that's, that's sitting here talking about you waiting on the Lord, I need to encourage you. Start doing something. Do something. At least, listen, this is going to sound crazy. But at least be wrong before you get right. Doing nothing ain't no choice. At least be trying something. At least, at least, because see, life circumstances are going to push you to have to take some action. You've got an anointing. He's got his ordination on you. But you've got to get to the place to where you're not afraid to act. The spirit of fear has gripped so many 
forgive us. Because we could be doing so much greater. He says, watch this. He's, put, he's got people. But watch this. The placement is in the process. you got to know that you're on a journey. You're not going to stay in the same place with the same people all your life. If all you want is what you have, you don't have any desire. No drive. Let me say it again. If all you want is what you have, you have no desire and no drive in life. you got to want more than what you have. In relation to people, in relation to your anointing, in relation to your life, if you live in there's more. And I'm not just talking material things now. I'm talking there's more growth. There's more peace. There's more joy. There's more accomplishment. He's got people ahead of you. He's got placement for you. But now watch this. The Bible says, watch this, that, that, that when you go among them, they're going to prophesy. They shall prophesy. Watch this. And watch this. And the spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy. Can I tell you something? Let me give you this too. He's got people. He's got placement. And he's got provision for you. He's already given him the anointing. Now watch this. He had the anointing, but he didn't know he had prophecy yet. Remember, Samuel only anointed him to command the inheritance of the Lord. So watch this. God has called us all to fulfill a purpose in life. But what we don't know is what all we got to have for the purpose in every season. He didn't say God has anointed you to prophesy. He says God has anointed you to command the inheritance. So whatever God has called you to do, he's not going to leave you short of what you need to be successful. If he call you to be a school teacher, he's going to make you love children, even though they get on your nerves sometimes. You don't know. He can't put you over children. He, he, your pur Watch this. Your purpose is not in teaching if you don't love children. Your purpose is not in pastoring if you don't love people. Maybe, maybe, watch this. Maybe you're a computer programmer. And he's anointed you with a logic and an understanding to do computer programming. So he built your character and built your nature to work in a solitary mode because all he needs you to do is get on that screen and do what you need to do. And you will prosper in that thing if you just find your place. But don't go try to be a people person when you don't really have the order to love people. You can't... You, you, you're a nurse. Who's a nurse? One, anybody two? Anybody that's a nurse in a service job like that where you're in nursing, you're an LP and RN? You can't do that and not like people. I, I was I was I was I was down with my dad when he was getting ready to get his surgery, and the surgeon came in. He's this, this part of this six foot two white brother, just great. And you know what he did? You know what he did? My dad is ninety one years old now. He didn't understand everything. You know what he did? This doctor went and took a knee at the bedside and grabbed my dad by the hand and said it five times to get my dad to understand. So I'm standing there. I'm watching this man work. Can't remember the surgeon's name. Watching this man's work. He's standing there talking to my dad. He said the same thing five times to get my father to understand. But you know what? With all of that degree, he didn't disrespect my father's humanity. Some of us can't do what we think we're supposed to do because we ain't got the right heart for people. Maybe you need to go make widgets somewhere when you ain't got to deal with folks. But watch this. He had oil. But he didn't have all the offices and the anointings he had to have. So watch this. Let me give this progressive thought. Sometimes God will anoint you situationally, and it may not be permanent. Let me say this to you. Sometimes he'll give you a word to prophesy to a person, but you're not a prophet. You just got a word in that situation. He gave you a word of knowledge and a word of wisdom, and you thought that meant you was a prophet. No, you've been striking out since you spoke to You've been striking out since you spoke the first time. He used you situationally, and you made situational permanent. Be careful. You got to know you got the order to do what you do. You know why I can't give up on this thing? You know why I can't quit? If I get down with two folks, I got to still be who I am. You know why? Because he's gave me the oil for that. I can't get away from the oil. Because if he's really called you to do it, it's almost death to you not to do it. People, placement, and the provisions to make him 
another man. Here it is. I got two minutes and I'm done. I want, I want to look at one more word. I want to look at one word in this context and I'm done. I'll make a note, Luke 4. Luke 4, how, how Christ says that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and he has anointed me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me and he has anointed me. Can I say this to you? You're anointed to be both king and priest. It's not always that you're going to come in church and do stuff, but God has anointed. Listen, you gotta have a you got to have a right mind to do what you do. And that mindset is an anointing from the Lord. It's some stuff I just can't understand. I just say, I ain't built for it. I'm not built for it. it it's okay. But if I get into my build, and you get into your build, and we let our anointings work together, we can do something. Just because you have the skill of hand does not mean you have the knowledge of business. You may need to get an office manager or an accountant or a business manager who can handle the business end and you just go create. Now get somebody trustworthy because you don't need them robbing you. But what do you need the company of prophets from? He was among, watch this, he took his oil, watch this, and he began to prophesy with them. Now let me tell you something about this with, and I'm getting to my last statement. He's giving them people, he gave them placement, he gave them provision. But watch this, he's also giving you something to bring to whatever you're going to take from. I know that does sound like anything, but watch this. The Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord qualified him to speak among the prophets. Now, wait a minute now. This is a company of prophets. They've been prophesying together for a minute. They've been in the high place. They've been in the presence of God. And now you tell me this person we don't even know. That there's no record that Saul had ever met these people previously. The Bible said you're going to encounter them. And watch this. Because of the oil on you, they're going to accept the word out of your mouth. Have you ever have you ever asked somebody for a service and you know they don't know what they're talking about? I remember Eugene Hogan the other day. I was out walking. Yeah, we all remember Hogan. Do you remember Hogan? Gene, Gene, Gene P. Gene, Gene used to have a beard way down here. Gene beard was so long. Y'all know. <laughs> Gene beard was so long down here, made his head look like a lapel with all that beard. <laughs> I said, Gino! I was walking. I said, Gino, you cut your beard. He said, I sat in that chair and I asked the dude to trim my beard and he hacked it up. He said, needless to say, I ain't never going back to him no more. <laughs> he hacked him up pretty good. <laughs> it, was, it was almost all gone. Here's my point. Have you ever sat for a service and you really didn't know what they was talking about? My Lord. Let, me, let me tell you this. If, if you feel like I don't know what I'm talking about in here, don't sit here. Because I can't serve your life properly if I ain't got the right oil to speak into your life. And if you offer a service, do your due diligence. Know what you're talking about. Because if you do the work and do the work properly, it'll be a lasting effect. But if you go that stuff up and just chop it up and don't do right and give half stuff, half information and half action, it's never going to work. At least be excellent. At least let the oil on your life open more doors with the company of people you got to stand up. Are you, oh God, I hear you host, are you recommendable? <laughs> would, it, okay, would anybody put their name on you? I know this one, you can trust him. I know that one, you can trust him. Hey, can, hey, can you go make this? Because because watch this, I'm telling you, I've, I've been through it right here, right here in Impact. Another man! <laughs> Let me stop right there. Another, if I say another man. another man. In this context, man is not just about your humanity. Here's why I started pushing on that one. Because man means champion. Oh. In this context, when it says he was changed into another man, the word actually means, the word um, 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 ish 
It means it, it means human or male, but it also means a champion or a great man. Have you ever thought about that maybe they ask you to do the extra shift, not just because they don't have nobody, but because you're good at what you do? They know you will take care of them. Because you've taken everything from your life now, and you use it to help somebody else. Have, have you ever, I, I go to Bible study on Monday. You know, I, I tell you about my Bible study group on Monday. And, and one of the things that, that blesses me, and I'm done, give me some song, Isaac. I'm done. One of the things that blessed me one day, I was out riding with, with Randall Rhodes one day. And Randall Rhodes, his, his family used to own the brick on the brick companies here, Jenkins Bricks, I think it was. Was it Jenkins, I think it was? One of the, one of the brick companies used to be here. And Randall, Randall, we riding around the city. And Randall says, That's one of my houses right there. That's one of my houses right there. No, that's not our house. That's, um, I can't think of the other brick, brick company name. Brick comes Jenkins and with somebody else. He said, that's my competitor's house right there. But that's my house. That's my competitor's house. That's my house. And I'm looking, I'm like, what do I know? What's he talking about? He says, I can know the brick behind the mill. And I know the sand that was used to make that brick. So my company makes certain colors of bricks milled a certain way because of where we get our sand from in Alabama. He says, now that's not my brick. That brick's too dark. I don't use that kind of sand. But that house right there, that's my house because I put the brick on the house. He ain't living in it. Somebody else's name on it. It ain't his address, but his excellence went into it. Can you go back and look at your glory and say, that's my glory? Can you see hair dudes walking around the city and say, that's my hair? <laughs> Can you see children graduate and say, that's my child? Not because you own them, but because you invested in them. Because you became another person, they can be another person. Because you didn't stay where you were and accept what they said, you decided to do something different and now you can make some. Can you look around and see your work produce? Can you look around and see a patient and say, yeah. How you doing? It's been three years since how you doing? It, it, was, it, was, it was your appendix, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How's everything going? We, we're good now. You healed up everything? Can you look back and see your work? Can you look back and see folks with your lap scars on? See, what I'm, what I'm saying is, what can you be excellent about? Can you look and see folks wearing your clothes? Can you look and see? Can you, can you see? Can, can you be on that phone and hear a happy customer? God is trying to make you someone greater than who you are. Wants you to be another man. And the company you stand among and the journey you're on and the gifts you have are all a part of making you greater. Now, I'm not, I don't want you to get focused on it's just be about being you. But the best you helps me be the best me. The administrative work. Every, everything we do in this room is useful in the kingdom. Whatever it is God has given, just be excellent at it. And allow the anointing that's on your life to begin to touch other lives around you. Would you be another man? Would you be someone greater than you are? Because you're still in progress. Look at your name and tell them, we're still in progress. We're still becoming. We're still becoming. But don't stop where you are. He'll give you the proper people, proper placement. He'll provide you what you need to be provided with. And he will totally change your world. Watch this. Ephesians 10. We're standing. Everyone's standing. We're done. Nine we're done. Uh, look, uh, you, you know, you know one of my favorite passages. Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh. Yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And all things of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That reconciliation is bringing you back to your original design. I'm trying to tell you, it doesn't matter what your family name is. It doesn't matter where you come from. God, watch this, and let me say this to you. God has a created seed in you that 
wants you to be greater. Can I say this? And, 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 and listen to this. And this, this is something I didn't say to you, and I ain't got time to teach you today. But everybody has the breath of God in them. Every person in the world. It's called the Ruach. It's when God breathed into mankind. So just the fact that they're alive says they've got the breath of God. But watch this. Everyone has it entered back into covenant with it yet. Because now you need a relationship with him through your son, through his son Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, if you allow yourself and you reconnect, and don't just reconnect, but let it change you. Not after the flesh, but after the spirit now. He's trying to do something different in your life. And he wants you to be another man. Can you look back over your life and see that you've changed at all? I mean, I'm asking for a show of hands now. You've changed. You, you ain't told it out. You may not be all the way there. Maybe some stuff you still struggle with, but there's been some change in your life. Amen? That means you're in process. That means you're in process. Hallelujah. Quit playing in church. Quit playing in church. But you're different. And you're well on your way. Can I just nudge you to go a little, little bit further? Here it is. There's some things God wants you to yield to. There's, there's some things that he's been dealing with you on in your spirit. He's saying, get this right, make this right, make this change. It's just the next step in you becoming a greater you. All right? So let's pray about that. I want to pray about the next step for us. Okay. Each of us is individual. Whatever your next step is, it may be enrolling in school. It may be, it may be forgiving somebody. It may, be, it may be releasing somebody. It may be taking a step that God wants you to take. But whatever it is, let's pray about your next. Amen? Amen. Father, right now, God, we commit ourselves to the next. We're asking you, Lord God, even as you took and you, you put out the oil through your prophet Samuel and you told Saul to do A, B, C, D, and E, that you give us our A, B, C, D, and E for the next okay. season. You show us what we need to do, the next steps we need to take to be better people, to be in your providence, and to allow you to use our lives to manifest what you want to manifest in the earth. God, we know you've given us oil. You've given us the anointing. You've empowered us to do things in this earth. You've given us the work of our hands. You, you, you've taught our hands skillfully. We know how to do. You've given it to us now, God. Now give us, Lord God, the, the, the conviction and the anointing and the power to make a difference in this world around us. Whatever kingdom, Lord God, we have to conquer, whether it's education or arts and entertainment, whether, whether, it's, whether it's the family, whether it's the church, whatever kingdom you're sending us into, let us go into those kingdoms and bring your kingdom to bear. No matter what it is, Father God, whether it's government, whether it's politics, no matter where you're sending us, God, let the kingdom show up because we showed up. We give you rulership over us in this governmental season. And we enthrone you once again. If you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, maybe you're in a place where you need some additional prayer. Maybe you're in a place where you need some additional prayer. Um, you can come. If you need additional prayer, you can come today. You can come today if you need additional